Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guest is Karen Essex. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brews. And you can go ahead. Welcome to episode number 52 of Books and Brews. How's your month been, Laura? (laughs) Well, uh, we had yet another surprise. Uh, We thought that we had four little bunnies and then three even smaller bunnies. And once again, every time my son goes to the garage, more bunnies appear. And so all of a sudden we got a call. Uh, You said there are three really little bunnies out here. There are actually five. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We started with three, then we got four. Now we have five more. Yep. So what do we have a total of 12 now? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. And uh, we made a rush trip out to Tennessee, Mm -hmm. uh, saw our new land and our new house out there. Um, And that was interesting because having had surgery not that long ago it was it was a little bit uncomfortable for me how about for you Uh, it was thoroughly comfortable for me but i hadn't had surgery recently so you know no worries right but i did okay so i was able to help with the driving a little bit any other exciting news that I've forgotten well the chickens are still laying eggs you know which is important so we have Mm -hmm. all the eggs we need uh, i'm sorry say again you have chickens yeah. Yes, we do. We have four of them. Uh, I refer to them as the biz- busybody four. Uh, <laughs> they're always clucking and moving around, having a great time. But we get wonderful uh, eggs from them, and uh, they're incredibly tasty. And the secret to success with chickens is mealworms in their feed, um, which sounds yeah. entirely disgusting, but it uh, actually works for them. So, you know, we're very happy with that. I'll have to pass that on. My daughter has become a passionate chicken farmer. Oh, has she? Oh, fantastic. How many chickens does she have? 20. Oh, my. That is passionate. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, I guess we're more dispassionate chicken farmer. <laughs> well, we, we need to find, and of course, now that we're moving, you know, no point getting more now. But once we get settled in, we would like to sell egg subscriptions. And then it'll make sense to have more, knowing that we'll be selling the eggs instead of just hundreds of eggs piling up. So, have you read any anything interesting um, this month? I have finished almost all of the Kurt Schlichter novels, which is kind of a dystopian world, um, very political. So people are either going to love or hate those books. I finished The Invisible Life of Addie Larue, mm-hmm. which I mentioned last month is about a twenty three year old who sort of accidentally makes a deal with the devil. And now she's going to live forever until she surrenders her soul to him. And so um, it was a very long book. Mostly I liked it. But by the end, I went, this is a classic outwitting the devil story. And (laughs) I'm sure you as a writer know that there are, what, like seven basic plots, 36 basic plots, depending on on how people uh, work that out. And then I started writing the memoir because... I'm kind of writing a memoir and I don't really know if I'll ever publish it or not because, you know, that can be uh, tricky. (laughs) Based on the memories that are in the memoir. Right. How about you? Did you read anything? Yes, I read a couple of books. One was another Lee Child book Mm -hmm. um, for Jack Reacher, 61 Hours, set in uh, winter South Dakota, which probably, if anything, is worse than our winter. Yeah, probably. And uh, then I read a Nelson DeMille book called uh, Word of Honor, which was about uh, Vietnam, a 900-page tome, which I managed to finish in about a week. So that was that was exciting. It was very well done, though, as his books Ooh, are. Yeah. How about you, Karen? Do you get a lot of reading in? I do. I read uh, at night, every night. Um, I make time for it because I read so much research um, Mm -hmm. for my work that um, if I'm not careful, I end up not reading at all. So I do make time for it every night. And at the moment, I'm reading a very funny book called um, uh, Mercury Pictures Presents by uh, Anthony Mara. And it's it's about um, Hollywood in the 
30s um, and Italy at the same time. And it's, it's pretty fascinating, but he also has a very dark sense of humor. Um, <laughs> Sounds like something I'd like. And yeah. that actually plays into your uh, recent book too. But I suppose before we get too far, you should ask me. I would like to know a little bit more about our guest. Perhaps you could tell us. Um, I say this every month and I mean it every month. I'm excited to have this month's guest. This is Karen Essex who is an award-winning, best-selling author of six books. And I just want to say, Karen, I believe you are genuinely a best-selling author. I see a lot of people who play word games like, you know, a six uh If you define the genre narrowly enough. Right, right. Like, yeah. I'm a best-seller in, and there are like 16 qualifiers, and it's like, yeah, that's because there are only two people who ever wrote a book in that <laughs> category. I noticed that recently. I think it's just something that people throw in. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's annoying. Um, but I am a best-selling author, and my books are published in 29 languages. Um, that's oh, congratulations. an incredible accomplishment. So Karen Essex is the genuinely best-selling author of six books, including Leonardo Swans and Stealing Athena. She has recently co-written a pilot based on her two-volume novel, Cleopatra, for Netflix, with Lauren Hisrich. Hisrich? How, how do you pronounce that? Hisrich. Okay. Creator of The Witcher franchise. And uh, I got lost in my, <laughs> my own qualifiers there. Um, Lauren will executive produce, I think right. is what that was supposed to say. Uh, Karen has also adapted Anne Rice's The Mummy for James Cameron and Fox Studios and collaborated on adapting her novel Dracula and Love is a series for A&E Studios and Lifetime. She just completed a historical novel about the fabulous <laughs> darling Gabor sisters the first global fashion and glamour influencers, and she's determined to enjoy her summer. <laughs> I, the only thing I'm not doing well with is that last part. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. Are you just too busy? Yeah, just too busy. And I, I'm at my house in New Orleans, and uh, just a few days ago, there was a article about how this hurricane season is going to be very bad. And so I have had men here all day to further hurricane proofing my house battening down everything <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. yeah it's a real challenge to own a house in hurricane territory you know i lived in biloxi mississippi for oh, two months <laughs> that's, that's life in the that military right. that's yeah. life in the military yeah. and it just so happened that it happened to be the two months of hurricane season oh. so um what is our first cocktail? Well, I was inspired in the first reading by all of the wonderful, interesting touches of fruits and, um, you know, uh, the need to put up wine for the winter, long nights of the coming winter. And of course, the priestesses of Princess Cleopatra in their blood bright robes, which yes. I thought was a wonderful phrase. So I was inspired to create uh, an interesting cocktail that's basically a nice summary treat. This is a... Um, winter wine cocktail. And so we're going to start with uh, some ice in the glass. And then we're going to mix sangria with red wine mm. and add a little pumpkin pie spice to it to give it that winter uh, and kind of old world feel. Nice. So we uh, will show you in a second here, but I'm starting with the sangria. And then we have our red wine in box form to make it easy to uh, pour. And then a little pumpkin pie, pie spice on top, just for fun. It sounds a bit like, um, like mulled wine. Is yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, without the heat, I suppose you could say, because it's more of a summery cocktail. So cheers. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. Plain wine. <laughs> mm. I'd be curious how this tastes with uh, different sorts of wine. Mm, yes. It, to me, this is, I'm not sure what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little tart. Did you get some of the pumpkin pie, pie spice? I'm not as sure. Because well? I think that 
mellows it nicely. I just got a little. That's interesting. Um, I might finish that later. <laughs> <laughs> so before you start your first reading, though, I came across this when I was researching my own books, and two of the characters are always kind of trading jokes at the end of their emails with each other. And so I stumbled across the world's oldest joke. When I refound it this time, it's actually the world's second oldest joke that we know about. And it goes like this. Um, how do you entertain a pharaoh? And for some reason, this came up in teeny tiny little font. But the answer is, and this is from 1600 BC, you put a boatload of young women dressed only in fish net, fishing nets on a barge and you sail it down the river and you tell the pharaoh to go catch himself a fish. <laughs> that, you know, from what I know about the pharaohs, that sounds um, just about right. Um, you know, I, I was joking, actually, when I was working for James Cameron, uh, we were talking about Ramses the Great and I said, he had 50 wives, Jim. Why did, how could, why did he have 50 wives? And Jim said, I'll tell you why, because he's good. <laughs> and and that's one of those moments where I say that's the difference between men and women. Oh, I don't yeah. think any man is ever going to ask, why would you have 50 wives? No, and, and what woman would say, oh, I want 50 husbands. <laughs> yeah. well, not most of us. <laughs> what was it I said that to you about the other day? There, there was something you said uh, you were like excited about a tractor or something like that. Oh, yes. It, I, I don't remember the specifics, but he just looked at me like, aren't you excited too? I'm like, and that is the difference between men and women. <laughs> so it was a really cool tractor. <laughs> it, it was, it wasn't a tractor. It was something like it though. So I named this reading the Great Egyptian Parade, just to name it something. So now that now that uh, you know our 7.8 million listeners know the world's second oldest joke, go ahead. Your first well, reading. I'm, I'm going to tell you uh, how they did a parade in ancient Alexandria. Um, this, to me, as a New Orleans native, was Mardi Gras on steroids. Um, so it was a very opulent culture. Cleopatra's culture, very, very rich culture. Uh, her family had been running Egypt for 250 years, almost 300 years, and they amassed a lot of money. But every few years, when the king uh, had to placate his rebellious subjects, he'd get them good and drunk at the grand procession of Dionysus. And the idea was that the king himself was a representation of the god on earth or so all his subjects believed. So at this grand procession, they presented themselves, all the members of the royal family would present themselves as their, you know, the deity they were supposed to embody. And this particular section is from the perspective of the eunuch Meliager, who was also the prime minister. Eunuchs rose to very, very prominent positions in this culture. And I, in this book, one of my missions was to, um, was to do the eunuchs right because they were very um, they were very powerful men. They weren't these silly fat guys who you know supervised the harem. They actually in Alexandria they ran the kingdom. Um, so Meliager at this moment is he has a secret sinister plot to rid the king the kingdom of the king who he doesn't like and his wife Queen Thea whom he hates. And he intends to rid the kingdom of them and install Cleopatra's older sister, Princess Berenike, as monarch. So uh, we find him at the grand procession. Meliager watched as 600 slaves coaxed along the unwieldy wine barge. The vessel carried 30,000 gallons of that blessed drink and a drum of lion skin stretched to maximum strain around a circle of metal sp spikes. What an engineering feat it had, begin to, had been to get it just right. Despite his worries, he could not help but feel proud. The men and women, 40 and all, who stood inside the drum, laboriously stomped and jigged over the grapes while the scarlet liquid gushed into the street. It was an illusion that they caused the flow, of course, but it was a nice touch. 
As soon as the flood began, the dignified spectators in the Grand Pavilion became as greedy and anxious as any thirsty peasant. Several wine enthusiasts broke the ranks of the slaves to fill their conical leather flasks, big enough to weather the long nights of the coming winter. Move on, move on, a satyr costumed as a, a guard costumed as a satyr ordered one of the gluttons. He picked him up and threw him back into the crowd where he landed next to Meliager. The man's friends pulled back his head and sloppily emptied a pouch of the elixir into his mouth. The eunuch felt the sticky surplus creep into his sandals and between his toes. By the time Princess Berenike reached these spectators, they would be entirely blacked out from spirits. The king's subjects were in a jovial mood as he approached on a swaggering elephant. Under a canopy adorned with ivy, fruits, crowns, drums, and masks of comedy and tragedy, the sun highlighted just enough of the gold in his costume to make him appear a great shimmering god. Flanking his majesty on horseback was the order of the first kinsman, including the newest member, a good-looking, long-haired youth whom Miliager resolved to invite to his next dinner party. The next sight filled him with loathing. Queen Thea, costumed as Aphrodite rising out of the sea, was not nude, but wore transparent green drapes about her body and tiny conch shells under her breasts. Sparrows and doves, the birds known to take the air with Aphrodite, fluttered in the golden cages on either side of the queen. The second born, the infant boy, Ptolemy 13, represented the god Dionysus as a baby. Miliager had argued with Thea about the inappropriateness of her costume, patiently explaining that the product of the union of Aphrodite and Dionysus had been the grotesque Priapus, and that people would laugh at her baby son if they made the connection. Miliager, you are too rigid, she had said. Not everyone is so exacting about the gods. A ray of light shot into the crowd. Miliager and those about him looked everywhere for the origin. On an elephant-drawn float, Princess Berenike stood as still as a statue, holding her shield at just the right angle to catch the sun. She was dressed as Pallas Athena, goddess of war, in her battle gear. Her baby sister, the Princess Arsinoe, Firstborn, firstborn to Thea shared Berenike, Berenike's float and her glory, wearing a goat skin and representing the goddess at birth. The float carried all that the goddess invented, flutes, horse bridles, spinning wheels, ox yokes, numbers, and small, scales, small scale models of chariots and ships. Atop the entire production was a banner with the goddess's motto, Athena never loses the day. Dozens of maidens in war attire surrounded the radiant Berenike, yelling Olulu, the victory cheer, into the crowd. And a troop of little girls armed with light shields and lances followed on foot like a diminutive Amazon army. The princess looked like the goddess herself, fierce, distant, numinous. Her combative nature was well served in the deity's guise. The long limbs, elegant necks and neck and feral grace all conspired with Athena's warrior persona to create an ineffable grandness. Oh, Lulu, oh, Lulu, shouted Miliager to the surprise of his peers who had never seen the reserved eunuch lose his composure. The response of the crowd to Berenike was an omen from the goddess, a sign of her destiny. He closed his eyes in prayer, his feelings of loyalty to Princess Berenike affirmed. But his sense of victory was short-lived. On a small float in the shape of the stone boat of Isis, the mother goddess of all Egypt, stood the princess Cleopatra, favored daughter of the king. The red robes of Isis, a striking contrast against her dark, ha dark hair and her child's face. She was attended by 20 priestesses, all wearing sacramental black wigs of long springy curls and blood bright robes. The mass of red hit the eunuch's eye like an assault. He felt his spirit sink into the depths of his bowels as, as if he had taken sick. Cleopatra stood at the rear of the cart, holding her thin arms out to the people as if to embrace them, to protect them like the mother goddess herself. The crowd moved by her solemnity applauded her and the tribesmen lifted their totems in homage, which they did not do for Berenike. 
Seeing the emotion she evoked from the people, the child herself thought, I have a flair for this kind of thing. The eunuch Meliager noticed the same. This one will be trouble, he thought. She would never possess the beauty of her stepmother or the regal bearing of her older sister. She was petite, almost diminutive, but it did not seem to matter. Luckily, she was yet so young, luckily. For unlike her stepmother, this one had an acute intelligence and could present real danger to his plan. I really liked hearing some of the background of that that I didn't know just from the readings. Uh, how old is Cleopatra here? She's about 12. Okay, so mm. really quite young. Um, you're kind of known for your very detailed research. And one thing, obviously, I've learned from doing my own historical research is the farther back you go, the harder it is to find accurate information. And you're, what, around 40 BC, 45 yeah. BC? This is, this is about 55 right here, okay. 55 BC. Okay, that makes sense because she's a little younger. So how did you go about researching that far back? Well, you know, the hardest thing is if you're writing about women because nobody wrote about women's lives. So basically, you know, all women's history is hidden history. We have, we have really very little idea of what day-to-day -day life was like uh, for women. Um, and, you know, Cleopatra left no memoirs, uh, unfortunately. Um, and most of her, what we know about her was handed down to us by Roman historians who were her enemies and wanted to destroy her legacy. So um, my deep dive, um, you know, I did a whole, a whole graduate program so I could study this. Um, and my deep dive was to study the whole culture around her. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily, the Egyptians were very good record keepers. So we know a lot about, you know, who, what, and when. And also, we know that um, we know a lot about the city of Alexandria. We know what a lot of the contemporaries thought about the royals. Um, but, you know, I, I just, yeah, I went crazy. I mean, I thought I would research for about six months. And in mm -hmm. fact, I researched for seven years. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you're going to write about a woman from the ancient world, you need to study the culture around her. Right. And I believe you even went to Egypt and went to all the places that she traveled. I did that. After I did my um, academic research, I went to all the places that I could access that she had been and tried to walk in her footsteps and really absorb the, you know, this, the atmosphere and the surroundings and, um, you know, see as much of the, the rubble. Right. As, now, as I'm, I'm kind of curious. When I was doing my research, my books are set in the time of Robert the Bruce, um, the years from uh, Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 up to about 1319. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of the things I learned was that even going to a place, because I did the same thing, I went to Scotland, I went to what little they know of where the Battle of Bannockburn was, and then I came across a book saying, but what you see today is not necessarily what they saw. And I'm, I'm kind of curious if you ran into anything like that, where what you're seeing today is not what she would have seen, because the land changes, the, you know, the dampness, the waterways, even the whatever. level of the earth, really. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did you have you run into any of that? Um, well, I knew, you know, I knew that I wasn't seeing exactly what she saw. But in some of the ancient places, like I went to the city of uh, ancient city of Ephesus, which is in Turkey and so marvelous, and you know, I I just literally walked the pathway that she and Mark Antony walked when they deboarded their ship and went into the city. And, you know, it was extremely exciting. And the ancient city is still there. It's still really well preserved. So in moments like that, um, you know, I felt, I just felt these. these it's children. incredible. Um, there is a site in Scotland where a whole fleet of ships was launched, I believe for the Battle of Jura. And I know how you feel because when I yeah. stood there after having read about it so much, 
it was like I could almost just see this whole fleet of ships. So yeah, I bet that's an incredible thrill. It's thrilling. I mean, whereas on the other hand, ancient Alexandria is now in the Bay of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. You know, Cleopatra's city is in the Bay. This from mm -hmm. earthquakes and erosion and, you know, it's a sunken city. And now Alexandria pretty much looks like Miami, 1960. Um, you know, it's a very, um, there, there wasn't much left, but the, what I learned mostly from talking to Egyptian scholars there and going to the museums is I understood that Cleopatra's family were outsiders. Mm -hmm. You know, they were Greeks and they were running Egypt. And I, I, I didn't quite get that sense from my graduate studies, but as soon as I went to Egypt, I started figuring that out and that enriched the book tremendously. I, I think that's so important. You know, what I learned was that you really almost do need to go to where your book is set, you know, unless it's set on the moon or something like that. <laughs> Um, yeah. That could be a little cost prohibitive, um, but you don't even know what you don't know. You don't know what questions to ask. Like, okay, it's a stupid little thing, a really little thing, but in Scotland, I found out about the uh, the midges. Nobody talks about the midges, and it sounds like you got the same experience where it's like, wow, no amount of study online yeah. or even a literal graduate degree exactly these things exactly, exactly. yeah so, i always think people who don't go to where they're writing about are cheating somehow you know i i'm glad i was able to you know it, it was such an eye-opening experience and you know that obviously is one of the reasons why your writing is very accurate um I wanted to ask real quick, even though we're in two minutes over time here, um, you had mentioned somewhere on your website, your blog, that the differences between Liz Taylor's Cleopatra and the real one are immense. What, what would be one or two things that really jumped out? Well, you know, the Liz Taylor, um, and I'm a fan of Liz Taylor, there's mm -hmm. nothing against Liz Taylor, wonderful actress um, and humanitarian, but you know, the movie portrayed her as this sort of bosomy sex goddess who seduced men. And Cleopatra indeed seduced men, but she was very far from a bosomy sex goddess. She wasn't, She, you know, when you see representations of her, she looked like kind of an ordinary Greek woman. And mm -hmm. um, Plutarch himself said it was not her looks. It was the fact that she had this melodic voice and she spoke nine languages and she was so charismatic. And also, you know, she, she ruled a country that had enormous wealth and was very strategically geographically located. So mm -hmm. I think that, that, you know, far from being two great Romans who were just blindsided by this sex goddess, I think mm -hmm. Anthony, both Antony and Caesar had their eyes on the eastern part of the world and they knew that they you know launching armies from egypt would be a really good idea mm -hmm. so um it was all much more politically arranged than history would have you believe <laughs> <laughs> and i think even today so many things are very political oh, yeah. <laughs> very, um we are ready for cocktail number two all right all righty uh, this one I was inspired by the presence of the Egyptians in the second reading. And especially I love this phrase about in traditional Egyptian clothing, they moved about like a hive of nervous white cloaked bees. You know, that to me just struck me as this, a wonderful inspiration point for a cocktail. So I found this honey and mint whiskey smash mm. tail, which uh, first of all, we start off by muddling uh, a bit of lime with some honey just to try to get these flavors going. We then uh, add some ice. And we happen to have some uh, wonderful honey whiskey here to uh, add to that. We then bring some double strong mint tea, oh, which we okay. mix with the drink. We had to prepare that a couple hours ahead of time so it could be strong and cooled down. Yes, and then we serve it with a little bit of fresh mint 
and a lime wedge. And so here we have the honey and mint whiskey smash. And I'll make mine while Laura tries it. So uh got to get a second glass. Cheers. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> a winner. I was thinking, wow, that sounds really great. Sounds yeah. better, better than a mint julep to me. Right. Um, it's much stronger, I would say. It's kind of a almost heavier quality to it. Mm. But there's definitely a lot of sweetness to it. So yes, with the honey. I, I highly recommend this one. Mm. So I have no jokes to proceed this reading <laughs> go ahead all right um of course i have to find it um it's hiding okay so this is a, is a scene maybe a year or two later when cleopatra is about 13 and um she's going to be sneaking out of the palace with her with mohama who is Mohama is a Bedouin girl who was caught uh, trying to rob uh, uh, the royal cartographers in the desert. And she was captured and taken as a slave and brought to Alexandria. And what Cleopatra, Cleopatra thinks Mohama is her new sort of body servant. And, but what she doesn't know is that the king has hired Mohama to keep an eye on Cleopatra because Cleopatra's adventurous nature is going to get her in trouble. So uh, in this in this reading, they have just slipped out of the palace in disguise. They're both disguised as peasants and they think they're gonna spend the day in the marketplace, but instead they get caught up in a little bit of trouble. So Cleopatra and Mohammed had no agenda for the day, only de the desire to escape the court on a day of perfect weather in a city known throughout the world for its welcoming climate. Swollen clouds dappled the sky, moving with the sea breezes over the late morning warmth. The smell of jasmine struck their noses as they skipped along the canopic way. Free of everything, even her own identity, Cleopatra pranced along Mohammed's long gate dodging the loping Egyptian women, balancing huge earthen jugs of fresh drinking water on their heads. Swinging their baskets through the gate of the sun, they raced through the southeast corner of the Jewish quarter, to the footbridge that crossed the canal and into the fashionable section of town where Greek aristocrats kept large white Mediterranean houses built in the style of their homeland. On the boulevard of Heracles, a crowd of perhaps a hundred men peppered with a few women gathered in front of one of the larger mansions. In traditional Egyptian clothing, they moved about like a hive of nervous white cloaked bees. Some faced the front courtyard yelling angry words at the closed gates while others gathered in small groups talking excitedly among themselves. The horses and carriages and camels that had carried them into the Greek quarter lined the street. Perhaps someone has died, exclaimed Cleopatra, quickening her pace. As they moved closer, she heard a man yell, show yourself to us, you coward. They're calling to someone inside the house, she whispered to Mohama, who did not speak the language of the country that held her captive. Murderer, you must answer to the people, shouted a young man in belligerent but very correct Greek. His dress was of a fine linen, linen belted with an embroidered sash. His face was recently shaven and his skin oiled and smooth, signs that he had just visited that ancient practitioner of cosmetic arts, the barber. His skin shone in the moist heat of the noon sun and he smelled of high quality myrrh. Cleopatra recognized him as the son of Melchior, the exegete in charge of city services. An educated Egyptian with a command of Greek not the sort of person who uh, normally attends a demonstration. He's the son of the city exegete. He must be here on his father's business, she whispered to Mohama. There is no official business here. Let us go quickly, said Mohama. It was the first time Cleopatra had seen her afraid. No, let us investigate, the princess countered. Perhaps we will take information to my father that is valuable and we shall be rewarded. If your father finds out that we have been in the streets, you will be locked in your room and I will be executed. You know his rules. We must only go to the stables. 
I will protect you, the princess said with authority. Celsius, Celsius, come out, Roman pig. The men shouted the name again and again, the pitch of their demand escalating. Show yourself, Roman fiend. What is the trouble here, sir? The princess asked the son of Melchior. She used the native tongue to enhance her disguise. You have no business here, girl, go on. Sir, I recognize you as Melchior's son. My, my grandmother, Selinki, was your father's wet nurse, she invented, hoping the man would not deign to know the name of his father's nurse. The man sneered at the princess. If you must know, granddaughter of a suckling cow, the Roman intruder who lives inside these gates and feeds his obesity from the bent backs of Egyptian workers yesterday murdered an innocent household cat. We are here to make him answer for his crime. The cat, the man explained, was a princely blue hair from the northern regions above Persia and a favorite of the Roman's cook who put out a, a piece of fish every morning for the animal. Yesterday, the cook was sick and the creature was deprived of his sustenance. He made his way to the dining room crying for his meal. The fat man was hung over from his endless debauchery and like all Romans, cruel. He threw the creature against a wall and killed it. He returned his attention to the demonstration while Cleopatra translated the story for the incredulous Mohama, who hailed from a land where a cat was not a sacred animal, but a nuisance. A small militia of Egyptians rode toward the assembly at a speed too dangerously fast for a city street, the drumbeat of the horses' hooves heralding their arrival. An outlaw army, thought Cleopatra, one forbidden by the king's orders to gather. She had heard of such ragtag bands, groups of men vacillating, uh, groups of men of vacillating allegiances that organized in desert regions or suburban deems, men who could be bought for any cause that had the funds to pay for their strong armed services. What are they doing here in the elite Greek section of the city? Well, they're, they're about to start a massive violent riot and Cleopatra and Mohama end up barely escaping it. Mm. So, and did that happen historically? Yes, um, okay. that, that did happen historically um, at that time and in, during that year. And um, yeah, there was a lot of tension because the king, you know, Romans were very, very powerful and mm -hmm. all, all the surrounding kingdoms had just become client kingdoms of Rome. And Egypt was the last one to remain free because the king placated the Romans. And so um, the Egyptian people resented his um, entertaining the Romans and doing business with the Romans, but really he was just doing it to save Egypt and keep Egypt free. Right, right. Now, I wanted to ask you, you actually got your start, I think, in Hollywood as a costume designer. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get from costume designer to vice president of a production company? Well, it helped to be very well read. I, you know, okay. mm -hmm. I, um, I, lo I, I loved costume design, but um, I'm, I'm a little bit mercenary. And when I first, you know, I was my major in college. I got out, I started getting jobs, and it, it occurred to me that I was going to work very, very hard for the rest of my life, very, very hard, and never really have any money. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, I'm a music major. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Except technically, I was playing very, very hard <laughs> and making no money. <laughs> so, uh, I just, um, I, I, you know, I obviously knew people had worked with people and I started asking them to train me on the production side mm -hmm. and um, they did. And then I started meeting more people and, um, and I, I consider myself very lucky because I would meet people, uh, you know, in positions of power and they were somehow, you know, uh, very impressed that I was so well read and the, I got hired, started getting hired in creative executive positions, which is that what is, I That is a neat story. One thing I wanted to add in the introduction, and I forgot to, uh, you probably don't realize this, but you are one of the very first people that I friended on social media when I started putting out my books. In I do that. I do, do you really? I absolutely do. I, I, I never forget a name. Uh, um, uh-huh. 
And we corresponded a lot. And it really struck me that you were writing books and you had so many children. I thought this woman is my <laughs> hero. <laughs> How did she do it? <laughs> I'll, I'll have to look back. Were we talking on Facebook or by yeah. email? Okay. I'll have to look back at some of those. I mean, 2009, that's, you know, what, 13 years ago now, 14. That's yeah. a long time. But you, you were one of the very first people that I... Um, of other authors that I started connecting with way, way back in the day. <laughs> so it's really neat to uh, be talking to you in person. Well, okay, by, you know, e person. E, e person. <laughs> You're like a virtual person. <laughs> um, so I think, unfortunately, we need to go on to cocktail number three because I had like six more questions, but <laughs> on we go. So here we are, you know, with a scene, of course, that is depressing at the very least, right? And um, as we see at the in the last paragraph, there's nothing left to do or ponder, only to pray for numbness, you know, all of this. So I'm thinking to myself, she's wanting to forget what's taking place here. So I happen to find a cocktail called a Forget Me Not, which oh. I think is, will actually be uh, quite nice. Um, this starts off with some, let me get my uh, glasses going here. <clears throat> for some ice and you know what better ingredient to have in a forget-me-not than tequila True so that. we'll start off <laughs> with some of that <clears throat> and uh featuring today i'm uh, bringing in uh, george clooney's tequila which uh, i don't know if you've had the uh um his casamigos tequila but uh you know when i when i first had this i said yeah i'd pay a billion dollars for this tequila company <laughs> 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 so a little I less. Um, How is it as a tequila? Is it good? Uh, the Reposado, I think, is fantastic. It has a wonderful kind of a caramel vanilla taste to it, mm -hmm. which, you know, many tequilas you need to have with lemon and salt and the whole shooting match, right? Mm -hmm. This is wonderful neat. And, uh, you know, you rarely find a tequila that uh, is going to taste good like that mm -hmm. uh, when it comes right down to it. The next ingredient we have is a little bit of apparel which is a uh, bit of a, a citrus liqueur. So we're going to add that. And this ends up being a rather fruity drink. So thinking from the Gabor sisters standpoint and the elegance, you know, especially in the 1940s, 50s and 60s and things like that, um, you know, this would kind of be the type of cocktail that you might encounter if the Gabors were meeting Frank Sinatra, mm -hmm. you know, or Dean Martin or something like that. We're next going to move into a little bit of uh, grapefruit juice pink grapefruit juice, of course, you know, in the uh, idea of the Gabor sisters. Uh, we're then going to have a little bit of uh, lime juice to throw into this. And I'll keep it light because lime is a pretty heavy flavor. But then the fun is we're going to have a little bit of uh, an orange slice to throw in and a little bit of a lime slice to throw in. So here we have our forget-me-not. It's a real craft cocktail. <laughs> yes, it has been Cheers. really fun seeing how many cocktails there are in the world and what he's coming up with. <clears throat> what do we think? Um, I'm torn between I really like it and it's really tart. <laughs> <laughs> I I think in the end I like it, but man, that's that's one I'd want to take slow. I think <laughs> between the grapefruit and the lime, yeah, it's going to be a little zippy. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could really make you uh, pucker up. <laughs> Maybe you could use a bit of that honey from the last one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, no kidding. That's a great idea. I think I'm going to try that. I think I'm going to try that too. <laughs> and we have a new cocktail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead with your reading, the Gabor mm -hmm. Sisters. Now, this is just a teaser because I finished a draft of it, but it is still really a works in progress. So this is just, this is a bit of... Um, of text I wrote on the opening page just um, as an introduction to the book. And this is a book about the young Gabors, um, not about the later, the later, I mean, they're very glamorous in this too, but it's not about their later years. Before the sexual revolution, social media, reality TV, and the Kardashians, there lived a family of beguiling influencers with a global following known as the Gabors. While we remember the whipped blonde hair, lavish gowns, multiple marriages, and the word Dalink sprinkled into every sentence like sugar on pastry, few know of this Jewish family's harrowing journey from Nazi-dominated Europe 
to America and to celebrity. This is that untold story. So this is uh, the book's prologue. Budapest, 1944. When Magda regains consciousness, she slumped in the gutter in front of the Hotel Astoria. She shakes her head to wake herself up, but the sun's glare punishes her eyes and makes her headache pulsate with ferocity. She looks down to see that a yellow star is pinned to her robe. It was not there before the interrogation. She curls into herself to hide it, as if crouching will make her invisible. It's all she can do. She cannot stand up, of that she is sure. As she tries to sort out what happened before she landed in the street, rough hands pick her up and toss her into the back seat of a beat up police car and speed away. She would have expected to be taken away by SS officers, not Budapest policemen, but these days they're basically one and the same. The two men in the front seat say nothing. Her head thumps against the window as the vehicle carelessly speeds over the holes in the road. With the war on, little has been repaired or updated in years. At least the throbbing pain traversing her skull takes her mind off the agony and the rest of her body. Where are you taking me? She gets the words out and is sorry she asked. She does not want to hear the answer. Where we took the rest of your family, the one driving sneers. That's it then, the end. The others are already gone. She will be executed and pushed into a mass grave on the riverbank, her body falling next to either a stranger or a loved one, perhaps even next to the one that gave birth to her. She's too tired and in too much pain to care that she is going to, sh to be shot. If it stops the pain, it might be worth it to die. And why not? Why would she want to live in a world controlled by evil? If only she could have said goodbye to her family, to Mama and Papa and Jaja and Eva, told them what they meant to her, or more likely railed at them for making her stay when she had the chance to escape. But then she'd spend her life without them, suffering the guilt of leaving over the reprieve of safety. What does it matter? In days, all the Gabors will be forgotten and the rest of the world will go on as if they never existed. On the road to death, there is nothing left to do or ponder, only to pray for numbness. To her surprise, it feels like relief. Perhaps that is what death offers. No matter if she goes to the fantasy heaven taught by the Catholics or is simply rendered non-existent, she will finally be free. Well, how is that for a cheer? Pick me up. <laughs> Cheers? <laughs> yeah, we need to take the honey bag out of there. <laughs> Maybe I, a few more shots of tequila. I, right, know. right. Um, I searched the internet and I couldn't find the answer. Why did Mag Magda end up left behind? Um, she wasn't left behind. She stayed. So Zsa, Zsa and Eva got out. Mm -hmm. Magda got out, but then she felt, but her parents wouldn't leave. And she came back specifically to make her parents get out. Um, and uh, she really suffered in, in the interim because of it. Okay. Um, this opening paragraph, are you familiar with the rape of Nanking? I mean, no? I'm familiar with the what happened, but... Okay, yeah. okay. Um, there's a movie sort of based on it called Flowers of War. And mm -hmm. reading this scene just reminded me of that, of the brutality of the viciousness that just for the sake of being vicious yeah. how do you how do you dig into a story like this and explain to your for yourself how does such evil come to be in the world I what really, makes i really don't know i i i you know i i spent a lot of time in germany and i loved it and i kept and this was in recent years, and I, I kept mm -hmm. looking for something in Germans that, in their character, that would give a hint of uh, how these people could have done this, and I couldn't find it. I could not find it. There's nothing about Germans um, that that would make them prone to do this, and I, and so I had to accept that somehow this evil is in all of us. Mm -hmm. We don't but you know we don't all express it um 
but but I think if you take a, I mean, we've seen it now in our own culture. If you demonize people enough, you get the mob exactly. on the bandwagon, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I was just thinking that as you were talking, you know, that there's a list that's been going around of the 10 steps toward genocide. And that's a major step is that you dehumanize. Mm -hmm. And so I you think... I think, number one, the Germans were told over and over and over for years on end that the Jewish people are, insert all these evil things. And I think there were also some who just felt like I'm one person. Even if they knew it was wrong, they didn't know what to do to stop it. Right. You know, and I, I think, I wish that more people realized that, that we're all capable of being what the German people were in the 1930s and 40s. And, you know, too many of us are like, nope, I'm better than that. Well, you know what? We're not because we're all susceptible to manipulation, to brainwashing, to being told over and over that somebody is bad. I really wonder, you know, having spent a lot of time in this era, uh, you know, and having studied a lot of war, you know, mm -hmm. I really, I really wonder what if, if I were in these circumstances, would I be a hero, or would I be somebody who was just going to do something to preserve myself and my family? Right, right. You know? And I wish that people today would not be so sure that they're the heroes, because yeah. it's only by asking that question that we have any hope at all of maybe being the hero to think about it and you know, look, look that question in the face and ask, who are we really? Um, you know, I was curious, all these marriages, what did they have, like 19 husbands between them? And uh, Magda ended up marrying, what was it, her sister Ava's former husband? Did I get that right? You, Zsa's former husband. Zsa's former husband. You know, and as I was reading that, first, my first thought was Sophie's choice, you know, and for for any of our listeners who aren't familiar with the movie, um, Sophie is this odd woman who lives upstairs, you know, in the upstairs apartment. And um, bit by bit, the guy, the American who wonders about this really weird woman, learns the story that she was in a concentration camp. And the guard just decided to be nasty that day and said, I'm going to kill one of your children. And either you pick which one survives or I'll kill them both. And at the last second, she shouts, take the little girl. And she lives with this guilt, you know? And I did kind of wonder first, all these marriages, 19 husbands between three women, you know, is this a trauma from the war? But then I read more about their mother and how she was always telling them, you're going to marry kings. Was it maybe that, you know, they were raised to believe that nobody was really quite good enough for them except a literal king? What do you think is the answer? Well, I think it's different for every sister. The mother mm -hmm. and her demands on them to marry rich and, you know, be famous were certainly a, a factor. Um, but Was she a mommy dearest type of a mother or? She was even more cunning than that. Because, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She made the girls really work for her love. Um, and she was very controlling. Uh she was a huge influence in their lives. Um, you know, I, I can't really explain why they, you know, Zsa, Zsa was always in search of true love. Um, mm -hmm. Well, at first they were all in search of somebody who would get them out of Nazi, you know, Nazi occupied Europe. Um, but uh, Zsa, Zsa really loved several of her husbands and could never, I think she was always fighting the, you know, she was so charismatic and so famous and she would marry somebody and then she would explode on the scene as either a star or a glamour icon or whatever. And it would it would really interfere with the marriage, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially in those days, the 40s and 50s and 60s, when, you know, people wanted a house frau, not Zsa Zsa Gabor, darling. And so she was always trying to maintain that balance, you know. Mm -hmm. um, for Eva, little known fact, um, Eva was bisexual. And the more I study her life, the more I wonder if she ever um, was really in love with a man. I mean, she, she there's a famous story. She was in a, uh, an elevator in Beverly Hills 
And this man says, oh, Eva, how are you? And she says, do I know you? And he says, I was your third husband. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You know, um, I think Ma Magda was much more rational. And there's a very tragic love story in the book that set Magda on a certain um, a certain trajectory. But she was the rational one. I believe her first husband died in the war. No, her. Well, he no. did. Yes. Oh. But, but that's not the tragic love story. <laughs> right. If that's not tragic enough. <laughs> yeah. It only goes downhill from there. Right. <laughs> so I think we're at the point where we need to ask, where can people find you? Um, my website is KarenEssex.com. Very very cleverly named. <laughs> E-S-S-E-X. Yes, and I'm Karen Essex on Instagram, and I'm Karen Essex on Facebook, and people are also welcome to email me at KarenEssex at me.com um, if they want to, they want to, or if you want to join my mailing list, you can um, email me at KarenEssex at me.com, and we'll put you on it. I do a monthly newsletter, um, which I hope is very informative and not so much all about me, me, me. Um, and uh, that's about it. I, I think I'm one of the most findable people in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, try having a name like Laura Vosica, although there are actually are one or two others I have found, which um, kind of shocked me because I didn't think there were. Um, so Laura, where can they yes. find you as well as and where can they find you and Michael? Yes. So Michael is at aperfectpint.net and he's a perfect pint at all the social media, which <laughs> if he were here, he'd tell you he doesn't use anyway, but you can still go look. Um, let me see. I had to write this down because Michael usually does this. Michael and I are the at symbol books and brews on YouTube and you can find our outtakes and the full audio podcast there. We're on Facebook at Books and Brews with Laura Vosica and Michael Agnew.com. Actually, Facebook.com slash. Um, and then Instagram, we are Book and Brews <laughs> um, because everything else was taken. Uh, do you have any upcoming events, Karen? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I would invite people to get in touch with me and either have me lecture to their uh, schools about women in history, or um, I just did a fantastic lecture at um, the Los Angeles Country Club to a big group, um, and it was about my book, Leonardo's Swans, which is about the women that Leonardo da Vinci painted when he was the court um, painter in Milan. And um, so I give that lecture regularly. I also love to connect with people's book clubs online, or if you're in Los Angeles or New Orleans, I will come and um, do a visitation. Um, Don't, and, aren't you on a tour to Italy or somewhere? Yes, I that's what I wanted your to side. mention. So this is very exciting. Um, an Italian tour group is putting together the Leonardo Swans tour of Italy, which- well, fantastic will take you to all the places, all of the locations in the book. And it's going to be a very, um, you know, history rich, but also food and culture rich um, tour of, um, of, of Northern Italy. Um, that sounds exciting. Yeah, very and good. I will be on that tour. I will join it at, at various places, but that is gonna be offered in the spring and um, again, if you just get in touch with me at KarenEssexAtMe.com, uh, I'll put you on the newsletter list and you can learn more about that. We'll have to see if we can join you. Laura, what's coming up next month? Well, um, because of my program that likes to copy and paste into like 0.2 font, I'm having to do this by memory. <laughs> but, and I say this every month, but I swear it is true. I am excited about next month's guest. Um, when I connected up with Karen about doing this, I had posted on, I think, the historical novelist page. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, a whole bunch of people answered. And it was hard to pick even just, I think I scheduled like eight months out at the time. And I just, I didn't want to schedule a full year ahead or I would have scheduled, I, I would have two years scheduled. 
So next month is Dan Coonan, and he has worn many hats in life. And I know they involved a youth coach and a CEO, but because it's 0.2 font, um, maybe if I put on like the second pair of glasses, what happens? Oh, I still can't see it. I don't think it. this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, his books, um, it's basically two books that are similar and both are called Presidential Spirits, like the sequel to Presidential Spirits. And the concept is that there is this saloon in an upper room in the White House that serves any drink you want, but only presidents can get there. And so it's these conversations among... And a few colorful waitstaff. And if you call, oh, you can read it. You've got good glasses. Um, and only presidents can reach this saloon. And so all 45 presidents of the United States, because this was written when there had not been a 46, um, go into this room and have conversations with each other. So wow. it's just, to me, this was one of the more unique concepts that That's I've heard. Fascinating. It would make a great play, too. Yeah, wouldn't it? I, I can easily see that being done on stage. That would be an easy setup. So this has been Books and Brews, episode 52 with Karen Essex. Cheers. Cheers. My pleasure.